So basically, they even like you can see like a compilation video where all the local news anchors say the same slogan. So you know they're being fed something from someone, and it doesn't matter if it's a local station in Boston or Toronto, or even Toronto, maybe, who knows? So with that in mind, I kind of want to posit that there's this issue that we need to think about and address when we communicate with each other, and it's this concept of there being a controlled narrative, that there is a play box of opinions that, or questions that we sh we're expected to have answers to. And if it's not in this play box, then we shouldn't be thinking about it. And if you try to think about it, it's actually incredibly hard to get a message out. So what do I mean by that? Transgender bathroom is not an issue that almost anyone has to deal with, transgender people included. Because like, it's just not a huge issue. But it's something that's been on the airwaves forever that every political commentator has made a video about or has discussed. And it's something that you very well have probably been asked, what do you think about this? You're having coffee with your friend. And they're going to say, like, what do you think about the transgender bathroom? What do you think about the girl eating the baby? What do you think about whatever inane thing it is? And sometimes it's inane, but sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, controlling. You know, sometimes there's a presumption built in that leads you to a conclusion that you can have choice A or choice B, but they're both wrong, right? So there's lots of ways we're having a controlled narrative and not being able to freely express ourselves in a way that's organic and is not kind of being secretly manipulated. You know, at least I think that's going on. And later on, I'd like to have a discussion, see if you guys agree. Um, but assuming that that is going on, and assuming that we have all these great tools like social, like Twitter and Facebook where we can say whatever we want, yet we still choose to talk about these things that are kind of like acceptable to talk about today, well, what do we do? You know, it makes sense that people do it. Like some of you guys make YouTube videos or other forms of propaganda, and you know that if you make a video that's relevant to what people are talking about, just by virtue of it being relevant, people are going to see it. And if you make a video that's not relevant, it's going to be it's going to just languish in obscurity unless you know somehow it gets goes viral or somehow it eventually becomes part of this narrative. So then the question is, how does it become part of the narrative? What is the narrative? And not something I have a great grasp on, but what I think is part of it is the fact that it's that nationalism that it's so heavily controlled from top down. And so my solution is this website, Bad Mirror TV. And I'm not saying it's the only solution, but I think it's part of it, where each neighborhood, town, city, has the ability, the people in that town have the ability to start creating their own narrative. So what I mean by that is this video player um, allows anyone to share a video with the town. So if you live in Lancaster, New Hampshire, where we're filming from, you can share a punk rock video, or a political video, or a fashion video, really whatever, that you think is awesome. And you know at the very least, local people are going to see it. So even if it's a terrible video, it'll be seen locally, and your, now your terrible video is part of the terrible zeitgeist that is your area. <laughs> now if it's not terrible and it's a good video, you can vote on the videos, and the reach of the video increases. So it'll go from being just seen in this town to being seen in wherever this county is, to being seen in the state of New Hampshire, to the region, the country, to the country, to the whole world. And what that does is it doesn't, cr it creates kind of a merit-based hierarchy of culture, where there isn't a group of people, and I'm, I don't even know who these group of people are, or if they even necessarily exist, but assuming they do, there isn't that. The people who decide, yeah, this is reflective of what I believe or what's going on here, are the people who are watching the videos, who are sharing the videos and voting on the videos. And those people can be anyone you know, like you and your neighbors. Um, so my hope is that this website's going to lead to a decentralization of culture. And what I'm interested in kind of opening up to the group is, well, what would that look like? You know, we're so used to having this narrative fed to us from the top down that I don't even know what it would look like. And I'd be interested in kind of your perspectives of, OK, we have this tool that I've created. Not that many people are using it yet because we're still in like this quasi beta phase and we're about to launch nationally. And I want, I don't want to tell people how to use it, but I want them to think about it in terms of this, okay, I can now create a narrative and say, this is what's going on here. You know, um, so I hope I made sense, or at least a little bit. 
And um, yeah, I'd be kind of curious in kind of your take. Do you think there is a controlled narrative? If so, you know, who are the people? Let's start with that. Is there a controlled narrative? Um, anyone kind of like feel obligated? Andrew. Yeah, well, wasn't this the Facebook um, trending topics is the perfect example of this, where there's certain topics that trend on Facebook that's there's supposedly an algorithm and the most talked about ones trend, but Facebook reached in and kind of plucked the ones they didn't want people talking about out. So uh, they were accused of anti-conservative bias, uh, mostly. And it whether or not it was a coordinated conspiracy, the people deciding what the trending topics were we're all kind of, you know, Ivy League educated Northeastern people. So whether or not this was from the top Zuckerberg suppressed the conservatives, there still was kind of an informal cultural conspiracy to keep CPAC out of the trending terms, for instance, and a few other conservative issues. Um, so definitely I think it exists and is a big, uh, big power issue in today's society. Yeah, that's a great example. I think that anyone who's putting out a narrative is trying to control the narrative. Um, is it alright if we film you guys? Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. is that okay? Alright, anyone um, object, tell me. Um, anyone who's putting out media is trying to create a narrative, and so it, I definitely recognize that there are people who are very successful at making that happen. Um, the transgender bathroom thing, it's incredible, we're talking about it now, so we're like, we're extending the narrative um, that, that some people have been putting out, I, I don't know who it is, um, some leftists probably somewhere uh, came up with this thing and started putting it out. I don't know. I mean, we were we're putting out taxation and theft. At the same that's time. right. That's right. Yeah. And that's that's making its way around. Um, and so yeah, I think empowering people to to create a narrative of their of their own and then share their the narratives that they they like, um, well, I think would help decentralize a lot. I like that you use an like, example, like the taxation theft coming out of the liberty community is a good one. Can you guys think of any other ones, good or bad, where you're seeing people kind of able to create their own narrative? Because that'd be kind of interesting if we can kind of glean some learnings from it. Yeah, I saw some uh, funny things where they take like a Hitler quote and, it's, and have a picture of Bernie Sanders <laughs> and then see what the, the reaction is of the, the people that like or fans of him or whatnot or just don't aren't looking into it and then like just expose to do a second thing just telling them you know exactly what it is and then like seeing what happens after that it's kind of a little more involved but yeah yeah another good, like good example of kind of libertarian propaganda yeah, I'm libertarian propaganda, exactly. Whenever I hand out, um, I give out Bitcoin flyers a lot. I'm always talking to people, people about Bitcoin. But I'm always saying, like, oh, you're interested? Hold on, I'll go to the car and get some propaganda to hand out mm -hmm. uh, to you. Um, well, Bitcoin's a great example, right? So, like, if you know people who use Bitcoins, you Bitcoins alive and well. But if you talk to my neighbor, who I just recently met, and I had a conversation, she goes, Bitcoin, is Bitcoin dead? Well, why does she think that? It's because there's this narrative that's saying, mm -hmm. don't look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's like not in your best interest, mm. or it's dead. And those articles have been coming out since 2009. You know, every year there's a new article, Bitcoin's dead. They're really trying to push that narrative. Uh... Yeah. And so, can you imagine if there's like, like you're saying, you're talking about how local activism, you know, immediately impacts that? Because if now the person you're giving propaganda to reads that article and go, well, I met this guy Steve in the parking lot and he like clearly thinks it's not dead. What what the hell's going on? Yeah, and, and in that case, because it's so local, like they, they see me, we talk in person, they hear my voice, they now believe me more than the, the media narrative. Yeah, and it's easier to, to smash the mainstream narratives um, and replace them with your own, you know, not only in person, but because of the ability that everyone has to make a YouTube video or to publish something on um, their blog and get it picked up by a more mainstream blog and start to change the narrative by putting your own message out there more consciously. Like, what do I want to put out into the world? Yeah. Um, we were talking about it last night on a radio show, Freedom Fiends, how this guy Ernie Hancock made a um, re -lovolution, um picture, you know, and. Ron Paul ended up, he pushed it out for, for the Ron Paul campaign in 2008, and that, that meme is everywhere. I mean, seeing that re love evolution. Um, Bernie and, Sanders uses it now on his official campaign literature. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Well, 
so that so that's interesting. You kind of so you are you of the mind that being able to kind of broadcast it to the whole world is super effective at, at spreading a message, or do you feel that like this, like the fact that we're able to meet at an event like Pork Fest and kind of realize or localize these ideas, does it become more, do you think it becomes more powerful? And obviously it's a leading question because I have a hyper-local video website, but like, mm-hmm. I kind of want to talk about this local element, like what is it, why is it more relevant or important if it is? I was going to say that it's more relevant, like if I see a, someone in person, like there's immediately a stronger connection, and like I'm, I'll believe what they say over some more anonymous source. Yeah, I, I'm into. I mean, I guess it's it's up to every individual how much they care about getting a, a message, any particular message out, um, and what they're willing to compromise for it. But to give a, a simple example of something like Free Talk Live to me is something that's very basic, and they they do like Liberty Kindergarten. And so they, they end up um, reaching a wider audience, but it's not as interesting to me. You know? So I'm more interested in the narrow band, um, hyper local type stuff, as you put it. You know, talking with your friends and neighbors, and it might not reach as many people, but I think that's where um, that's where I would want to change the narrative is in person or, or more directly with individuals. There are still definitely cultural memes that are local. Um, you know, in Manchester, there's a big kind of citywide debate about they're putting some arches up, and it's all over the social media sites in Manchester. You know, in Concord, there's the Bearcat issue. Yeah. And the Free State Project kind of did create the narrative of the Bearcat issue. You know, it was a narrative because of uh, libertarian activists. So that's an example of us successfully kind of creating a narrative. You know, are you for or against the Bearcat? Well, j- even if you're against it, or for it, um, that narrative being created is kind of a step forward for liberty. I Absolutely, yeah, it puts the issue on the table. So, so, so far we've mostly been thinking about in terms of like political stuff and kind of like radical technology. But I mean, one thing that I'd like to think about in terms of this narrative, this cultural narrative being a lot in the arts as well. I mean, you, you kind of, Derek, um, do some interesting stuff where it's like tangentially related to libertarianism. Um, and it's more of the cultural stuff. And yeah. So, you know, I'd be kind of interested in discussing that. Like, at what point, in what ways can we think about culture as being this way to, you know, break free of whatever it is we think is holding us down? I mean... Like, punk rock music in general, like, for me, is like, yeah, very, like, kick some ass. Um, but, like, it'd be kind of cool if I saw, like, a really radical local cooking show like that. yeah well I don't think about the things in terms of keeping me down like I think about the things that are in terms of lifting me up like it's not being anti the man you know it's being pro your art or your yourself like whatever your mission is like it's, it's I'm not def- I don't want to define myself or anything I create as being against something else you know it's just its own thing and I would hope that that would be you know that would be the new trend. It's like I don't want, I don't want to be rebelling against something. I want to be forging a new liberty. Yeah, that's cool. Definitely. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I think that's a good way to think about it. I mean, um, I was watching this Fugazi documentary, and they're like, "You're a, you know, political band." They're like, well, "Like, what do political bands accomplish?" You know, yeah. um, being against stuff. So, like, yeah, being for stuff is definitely the way to go. Being for stuff that's local, I imagine, would be like the Bearcat example is, is that much more powerful. Fugazi said uh, it's not what they're selling, it's what you're buying. Yeah. So, I like that. <laughs> well, maybe it's not local that's important, but it's maybe it's relevant sure. to, to people. Like with, um, with Flaming Freedom, a show we do, like it's not just people that are around us, but it's, it's like way more relevant to them. Or like when we're putting out a, a, the narrative of like carrying weapons into nightclubs, like that's relevant for a very specific set of people, and so it's like it's easy to make that resonate with a small set of people. Um, so, like I guess that works with local um, in many ways, but there's also like kind of interest-based relevance. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Quick question um, on your Bad Mirror TV. Is does everybody who's on within the local area uh, 
video see the same video at the same time and can respond with each other at the same time? Or? No, there's not synchronicity with time. Um, in the future, there's going to be the opportunity to kind of like book a 10 minute slot where your video will be played. So like, if you want to come home after school and, and you know you're about to play, get played at like 4 o'clock, you like tell your friends to watch something. But we're not going to get Well, I mean, I, I say this because um, I have a couple of friends we met at Forkfest and you go on uh, this thing called SyncTube and basically you post YouTube videos and it goes in a giant playlist and then you see it all at the same time and can respond. That's fun. Yeah. That's what SyncTube? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to spell it. But it's true. No, it's a great idea. One thing that makes that difficult is that like when you play a location, your friends are probably going to be watching from a different area, uh, especially if they're pork press friends, so the algorithm may be different. Um, you know, your local content will be unique to you, whereas their local content will be unique to them. But for Free Staters, for instance, <coughs> Free Staters in Concord will probably still be saying Free Stater material in Manchester because the New Hampshire connection matters maybe to a slightly less degree on your algorithm than the local connection, right? You see interesting stuff from New Hampshire, right, if you're using your... Yeah, I mean, especially if it's like, if it's a local video and you're watching, you know, someone's, you're going to see it. It's just not going to be seen at the same exact time that your neighbor sees it. Um, the only that you're watching the same time. But I think that's a cool feature that we're going to have something similar to where you can kind of like book a time slot. Well, they, they, I think they also do a hack where like, if you just go to the website and the current uh, video that's opened up, it has the time slot. So it just uses the API to seek you to the to the time in the video. Mm -hmm. So the that's cool. No, the only difference is that we have this whole the local element. Um, it, theoretically, we could have everyone in the same town doing that, and uh, eventually we will have something like that. And thinking uh, it, like you said, is uh, pretty cool. Uh, even that'd be even more like specific. Are you hosting the videos on the website, or are you? No. Okay. They're so YouTube you videos and Vimeo videos. Okay. And you said you're going to expand it to pretty much YouTube video or any other kind of third-party um, video system you're going to try to be compatible yeah. with. Being video player agnostic was important because that way no single one can control us, um, theoretically. I mean, right now they're mostly YouTube videos, and if they pull the plug, that's going to like change our business entirely. But um, don't do that, YouTube. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, like if there's a huge third video player that comes out that everyone wants, we'll absolutely do that. Um, what about Facebook videos? Have you figured out a way to sync um, Facebook videos into it? I've never seen a, video, a Facebook video off of Facebook. I don't yeah. Know if it's doable. I think you're right, it's not. I think they're going to want to do that. Yeah. That'd be cool, though. Um, yeah, so. so I, I like know. the idea of, like, so I could make a video about what I'm doing in Portsmouth, for example. And instead of putting it on like a local cable access channel or something, which usually gets watched by nobody, I don't, I don't even know who has a TV anymore, um, it would be a way for my local neighbors to be able to see what's going on and access it through the internet, right? And if they like it and it's cool, then other people around, maybe even Boston, might start to see it, right? Yeah, yeah. In the local area, they could know stuff that's going on. Yeah, exactly. Cool. And I mean, you know, it's like, your local audience is really only important to you being local, and it's so hard to get to them. You know, like you yeah. can go flyer, but like anything online, it, there's not really many tools. Yeah. So, you know, it's like I used to make public health propaganda videos because I have a public health background, and like the making, I learned how to make videos. I had my own public access channel. That only really took like three months. But then I'm like, oh, I have these videos, I don't know how to show them to anyone. Yeah. And, and that was a big problem. So, you know, that's kind of one of the influences for making this. Cool. Public access for the 21st century. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, something like that. That's actually a pretty good slogan. <laughs> Although people want public access, though, so we know, I, don't, I don't know. Public access doesn't, isn't sexy. Yeah, people just think of... Uh, Wayne's World. Yeah, Wayne's World. <laughs> <laughs> Local access. Local access, yeah. yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I encourage you guys to, like, check it out. Um, the way I envision the website being used is kind of in a very passive, like, it's on the background type way. So... You know, like I said, there's going to be some bad videos, um, you know, that you have the privilege of seeing because they're from your town, and you might not like them very much, so, but, you know, you can download them or whatever, but really the idea is that, like, you have friends over, you're doing work, 
and you can have a bad television show like broadcast show on and talk over it or you can have this on and talk over it and every once in a while there's going to be a video that really catches your eye and you're going to be like holy crap that's my gardener and he's, gonna, he's a bass player I had no idea. <laughs> you know, so it's just a way of kind of connecting with your local place and you know I'm going to keep thinking about this kind of question of controlled narratives because I think just by virtue of people using it I think it's going to challenge it but I think there might be a way to like push that along, be more conscious about it, like, say, you know, like, say, you know, this is, I'm from here, and this is what we believe in, and, mm -hmm. you know, you disagree, fuck you, and then someone else is mm -hmm. like, well, I live here too, and I disagree, you know, and have some kind of, like, lively debate. Figure out what the controversy is in the local community, and kind of, like, push that controversy as a way to get them to stop talking about whatever dumb national controversy there is. Yeah, uh, here. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and even if something, even if something, like, kind of goofy, like having towns compete in dance contests, that's something you can think about. Yeah. Um, have like a music video and they're dancing on the town. Um, so if any of you want to do that in your town, um, let me know. <laughs> I'm looking. Yeah? Okay, cool. Because like I'm looking for towns to dance in. <laughs> Not myself, but help people dance. <laughs> um, so that's my website in a nutshell. If you have any more questions or you guys want to like come back, please do. Alright, thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you.